Welcome to the Exhaust Notes Podcast. My name is Nick Engvall. Today, I am joined once again by my co-hosts, Todd Yates and Rohit Malhotra, to talk about everyone's new favorite sport slash Netflix drama, Formula One. If you're a fan of F1, whether a lifer or just getting into the sport, or maybe you've just seen enough of it on social media recently to spark your curiosity, you're in the right place. Buckle that safety belt and enjoy the latest episode of the Exhaust Notes Podcast. Welcome to the Exhaust Notes Podcast. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Welcome to yet another episode of the Exhaust Notes podcast. We're the only podcast where we refer to diaper changes for all our young dads out there as shit stops. Today, I've got the number one driver in Todd Yates and our team general manager, Nick Engvall. How are you guys doing today? Good, good. Excited to talk F1 yet again. Yeah, man, I'm I'm looking forward to it. I feel like there's a lot of there's a lot of debriefing that's got to go on after this season. Okay, I was gonna I wasn't gonna bring this up, but thank you for doing this, Nick, because I believe they've stopped doing this. So I started going through the Formula One YouTube channel, which is something we had discussed in the previous episodes, and I remember, or rather, I saw actual video video evidence of the fact that there used to be driver debriefs after every course, and they've stopped kind of publicizing those. And for me, that's really interesting because obviously, as we will talk about later today, probably the number one topic is the most recent race, the Abu Dhabi special, as we like to call it. But I would have loved to have been a fly in the wall on whatever that driver debrief session would have been like, because I think this is as polarizing of a moment as we've seen in what is still, at least from this American centric viewpoint, a very young sport that has captivated this audience. So without any further ado, let's go and get into this beautiful outline that Todd Yates, our number one driver, has come up with. And we're going to kind of do a retro of how this past year went. And the first thing we're going to talk about is the race that's the most fresh in our mind, which was the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix. So without any further ado, uh, ado, gentlemen, before I ask, what were your thoughts going into the race? And what were your thoughts after the race happened? And I'll start with you, Nick. Oh, man, it's tough because the last few races to me have been a little frustrating that there's just been so much involvement and so much bickering around the rules. Like, I know it's a part of the sport and the sport is is literally everything is down to the, you know, millimeters of, you know, the rear wing, let's just say, right? But it's tough because as a fan, and especially as a fan who has been big into racing all my life, and now seeing like friends that I would never expect get into racing, paying attention, those types of things, I think, take away from just the pure enjoyment of like really great racing. Not to say that there wasn't really great racing because it was also, you know, undisputably one of the most exciting seasons I've ever seen in any form of racing. And, you know, so going into the last weekend, I was I was in that weird camp of I wanted Lewis to win, but I still wanted Honda to win the constructors title because I'm a Honda fan. I'm just not a Max fan so much. Um, So, you know. It's a tough, it's a tough place to be when you're when you're kind of siding on on two sides of of a coin that just can't land on both sides, you know. Yeah, I totally get it. And Todd, how about you? Like, what were your pre race allegiances if you felt so strongly about this? Oh yeah, I just wanted somehow Danny Rick to win the drivers' championship in in one race. No, um, uh, yeah, no, it was it was exciting, uh, tense. As Nick mentioned, the the stewards involvement the infractions the wing joke that you made uh all very spot on it was and i've been i guess you could call it say a diehard fan for 10 years or so pretty much since danny rick entered the sport um so but i can't remember ever watching even when i was a casual fan back into the early 2000s and somewhat in the 90s I think a season that felt this exciting of any, like on any level, um, even when Shumi was, you know, winning his fifth, his sixth, all that. Um, it, I, I felt almost giddy the night before I had trouble sleeping and we had to get up for West coast, our West coast time. It was what, four thirty or something to make the race by five. Yeah. So it was, it was just pure excitement. I was, just rip her in a go 4 a.m 
No, I was going to say, Christmas came early for Formula One fans in a sense because we got this race early in this uh, month, and then obviously we've got the actual Christmas. I kind of am like the both of you. I really had no dog in the fight, per se, but if you were going to ask me, I would probably side with Lewis just because I think I come from this unique uh, train of thought, rather, that I want to see the most dominant person ever continue his prime. So when he does lose, and this is, I guess, the most important for me, when he does lose in a fair way, it truly feels substantial because the one thing I think we as American sports fans are always obsessed with is the nature of the asterisk when it comes to every title. And this, to me, and you guys are my gurus, you guys are my historic panel, you guys are my everything when it comes to F1 history. The limited research that I did, this seems to be the biggest asterisk that there's ever had been associated with a title in the sport. Is that a fair call out? In in this sense, yeah, I think so. Like, it, there's never been, uh, there's been contentious endings, right? We have Senna and Prost that crashing each other out, but that was kind of a different, uh, different time, and it was, it was almost so blatant that it was like, okay, like, yeah, I get what you did there. Um, that kind of event happening, which everyone talked about, right? Everyone thought Max was going to crash Lewis out because he knows. He's got nothing to lose. Um, and that almost would have been a better ending <laughs> to this season. But it's, uh, yeah, it's it, it's one of the biggest asterisks in history, like up there with the home run record, you know? Hey, hey, hey. Easy there. <laughs> By the way, this is as bad as I am. I was like, well, yeah, I mean, Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa did, were on steroids, but they still hit homers. But then, of course, I forget the Barry Bonds fan club that is in the middle of my screen. Sorry, yeah. Nick. So please go on. No, I, I mean, that's a that's a great example, though, right? Like, I think this is one of those things where, you know, we, you mentioned like F1 Twitter, and I've been in a bunch of spaces and conversations with people on there, you know, since it happened. And you know, everybody can justify their perspective on, on all of this, right? That's the, that's like the, the one thing about formula one that is different than just about anything, any other sport, right. Is that there's the rules are so in depth and the specs, the requirements, all of the things that happen around the sport are so specific, you know, and going back to baseball, you know, baseball in the nineties, early two thousands, the rules were really gray for years, right? Like there was just workarounds for everyone. And I think that's the the hardest part. I kind of go always go back to, to that because I grew up playing baseball. Every kid that was halfway decent in my high school was taking all sorts of shit. And I never did. I, I didn't want to take the chance. I didn't want to, like, it was not, that wasn't it for me. But in baseball, you, you, you start that at such a young age, it's available over the counter. You can go to GNC and get, you know, literally get HGH off the shelf back then. And then as you see that those people grow into the game, they realize that that's not going to be enough to keep them at the top level. Right. And eventually they fall off and, you know, kind of have normal lives after you after, you know, maybe a couple of years of college or something. But like once they start testing for that stuff, you can't actually use it to your advantage. The thing about Formula One that's really interesting in regards to all that is that everything is so specific that you literally have all these moments of, you know, just like millimeters of everything be come into play, you know, like milliseconds come into play at every moment throughout the season. And I think, you know, I, I wanted to see Lewis win. I, I was super excited to watch the race. I think the hardest part, other than the stewards, you know, just being involved in almost everything over the past, like three, four, like not just involved, but like heavily involved. It was really frustrating. But also I came to the realization that, look, Max had the points. He was ahead. He didn't have to drive safe. We all know Max drives aggressively, but I also think that Lewis at Max's age was equally as aggressive in those early years. People talked about it all the time. Had, you know, would I like to see Lewis win? Yes. After the fact, thinking about it, it's like if Lewis was meant to win the season, he would have been in the, in the position that Max was in where he had 
nothing to lose, right? Like it's it, it was Lewis's race to lose. I'm taking out of the fact that like, you know, there are so many different pieces to that that could be questioned. You know, I, I honestly like I, I I saw the, you know, the potential lawsuits happening and it's just like I don't want to see that happen to the sport because it just it just leaves everybody frustrated. But at the same time, this is a, you know, a bazillion dollar industry. There's a lot of money riding on every one of these decisions and every one of these moves. So, you know, I, I guess, you know, we're recording a, a week or two out from from, you know, the finish. So I can I, I'm I'm coming to that point of peace with it, but I don't know that I'm still there. <laughs> No, I was going to yeah. say, I think acceptance is the either the fourth or the final stage of acceptance of the grief. So you're doing a tremendous job. <laughs> Todd, do you want to add anything on top of that? Because I think this would have been a very different podcast. I think it would have been a little bit more animated and a lot less measured had we done this Sunday, the night of the race concluding. Because I think that's when ultimately we would all have that red mist. And I think I'm not talking about Ferrari when I say that. But <laughs> No, I, I, I think... Uh, I also, for the record, wanted Lewis to win. Um, but as Nick just said, it was Max's championship to lose. He, I, I just saw a stat earlier on, on Instagram that he led more laps this season than all of the other drivers combined by like 20 laps. It was like a, a staggering margin. So it, it's, it, I did also come to the stage of acceptance in this grief. Um, I don't really, I wasn't really mad at, at, at any point that Max won, but I, I just hated that it ended the way it did. Like, I, uh, Max deserved to win the championship. That's all fine and good. Um, but it just, that bitterness of Lewis getting robbed is, I don't know if that'll ever truly, totally go away. No, I think similarly, I kind of saw this in a sense as Lewis's last dance because per my knowledge, there's always been a will he, won't he retire question, especially in the last couple of years because he's proved to be so dominant in the sport. And it was one of those things that, yeah, I selfishly, I wanted the cherry on top of the Sunday, the bow on top of the present. And in a way, because we are at a time of the year where the Grinch often does steal Christmas, but he does give it back. So I'm really interested to see what happens in the next year because to your point, Todd, Max did famously well. Like, this is as close as we've seen Lewis Hamilton get pushed since probably, what, Roseburg in 2016? Yeah, Rosberg, And that was yeah. his own team, man. Rosberg, thank yeah. you. And it was one of those things where I almost felt like this was a little bit spicier of a meatball because from what I've read, and I wanted to kind of go down this tangent a little bit, the Rosberg championship was interesting because, correct me if I'm wrong, he was his teammate, so there was a little bit of internal t turmoil as well. Mm -hmm. But it seemed that Rosberg may not have been the better driver, but he was the better tactician from a mind games perspective. So I think what's jarring for me, even though I've only watched the sport for two years, whereas you guys have kind of put decades into this, it was jarring to see Lewis not only have a peer, but the unthinkable. Lewis got uppercut. He was Mike Tyson. And in a sense, Max Verstappen was Buster Douglas in Tokyo. So It's kind of crazy, too, because that was something that, was like blatantly obvious to me, you know, Max's Lewis is in Max's head every race, even when Max is light years ahead in the points, every move Lewis makes Max is, is reacting to, which is a very interesting thing to see kind of to your point. You know, I think that's Rosberg and Lewis, you know, years back, right. You know, Rosberg had the wherewithal to, to be able to, maneuver through all of that stuff that was going on and ultimately you just you know with especially with really young guys you just you you get in their head a little bit you force them to make mistakes and that's how you win in in racing you know and i think that's that says a lot about about max you know still being on top at the end of the season and just you know to the point of how many laps he led he was absolutely dominant and, you know, Lewis being the greatest driver of all time, depending on where you stand in that statement. I mean, you know, I, I don't think you, I don't know that we'll ever see something, you know, 
as close as we did this year. And also two completely different types of drivers. You know, if you're new to the sport, you might not see the difference in the drivers like that. But if you, if you're, you know, when, when this season's drive to survive comes out, hopefully that's something that's actually highlighted is the conversation around, you know, like full send max versus everything Lewis does, does and says, even, you know, even on the track is so calculated and, you know, that game, that cat and mouse game is, is something that I don't think too many 20, what is max 23 now just turned 23, I think or something like that, or just turned 24, 20, um, he's a young yeah, boy. 24, yeah. 25, something like that. Yeah. Like, you know, m- most people don't, you know, most people are at that age are still just like, you know, go out and get it right. There's no, there's no rhyme or reason to it. It's just like, I got to go get it. And to have him like survive that in a sense, right. is a very powerful thing. And, you know, personalities and off the track, you know, aside, I think that, you know, he, he he's going to be able to take that, you know, a long way if he gets the right, you know, people around him and keeps the right people around him, I guess is a better way to put it. But like, there's a lot of potential for him, you know, now that he's gotten over, you know, that battle such a, at such a young age. And I know the next topic that we had in our outline was driver of the year. So I'm going to use this as a segue and Todd, I'll kick it to you once I kind of just do this brief inner monologue. So my last observation when it comes to this debate is the fact that Max seems to be sent in the sense that he seems to be a very pure driver. He is essentially a true extension of his car and a car is true extension of him. Lewis seems to be a bit more like Prost in terms of the limited knowledge I have about Prost, where you had mentioned the fact that he's very professorial and academic. You can start to see that Lewis has transitioned to that stage as an athlete where his mind knows what to do, but his body doesn't have their reactions quick enough to do that. So he has to be a little more cagey and he has to be a little bit more wily. So I think it's going to be really fascinating how this rivalry takes on its second act because as of right now, it seems that the old possession arrow is Max might be the better driver because he has the tangential proof. So, Todd, is it fair to say that Max is the driver of the year or could there be an argument made for Lewis? Or are you, and maybe I'm going to pose this question as well, is assuming we all pick either Max or Lewis, give me, both of you, who is your non-Max or Lewis driver of the year as well? So <clears throat> that's funny that you say that because I would not pick Max or Lewis. And this actually Perfect. ties back into your second point. So Max, as we saw, is is raw nerve talent, right? Reactionary in the car. That comes down to the te- uh, tendencies of the Red Bull. It's got more of a looser rear end, so he has to be kind of sawing away at the wheel a little bit more. And Lewis, the, 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 the Mercedes is more planted, so he's a little bit more able to be calculated and that tactician that he's growing into that you mentioned. Uh, but going on to the driver of the year, I really thought at the beginning of the year and the run that Lando was on, he was going to be uh, driver of the year. And it, I think he was, I'm just trying to think, he was in P3 in the driver's championship through like six races, the first six races or something of the year. And I believe so. Yeah. And I was just like, as a McLaren fan, I was giddy. Uh, about that. And then I was also very disappointed in, in science to start the year and, you know, him coming up to speed in that car and he put in the work, he went to the factory, he went to Mugello, uh, you know, did the simulator work, whatever he did. But I would have to say to come in to a new team against an established driver in Leclerc who everyone in the F1 community rates as one of the top drivers. They would say Max Lewis, Daniel, maybe obviously he had a terrible year, but Max Lewis, Daniel, uh, Leclerc and Lando are probably in that. So for, yeah, for signs to come, uh, to come into a new team, to a new car, to an established driver or going against an established driver and not only match him, in most of the stats that you would track, but beat him in points. I know it was a little bit lucky that last podium 
was a, a little bit of a gift to him, but to be there, right. You have to be there to have the opportunity. So I would have to say, yeah, Carlos signs driver of the year for me. Yeah. I mean, I probably, I probably land on, on Lewis and Max just being like, look, they, they, they both to the final lap of the year, right? Like, you know, they both drove incredibly, both dealt with, you know, all sorts of different challenges, right? Like that Mercedes, both those Mercedes cars were incredible. The last five races, like on levels that you just start thinking like, is this even possible? Like, what I, do I know enough about the rules? Is this like legal? But, you know, I think to Todd's point, it, it was, it, it was just a really good year. It's hard to, to pick, you know, just one guy, right? Because both those guys drove insanely well. And, you know, you like, like Lando had that run early on. It was like, I was super stoked. You know, I, I, I would say I'm, I'm not the McLaren fan that, that Todd is, but I'm definitely a McLaren fan, but I'm, I'm definitely a Lando fan. Like, I mean, he is, you know, if I, if I was forced to pick, a driver at this point, like he's probably my favorite driver because he's going to be around for a while. He's somebody that I can watch, you know, for years and, and kind of fall along in his story. But I think even it's hard to pick one without also just, you know, kind of pointing out like Carl, uh, Carlos signs, obviously, you know, had a, a hell of a year to all of things that Todd brought up, you know, Charles Leclerc is, is, you know, almost like, you know, the prodigal son elevated in some way within the sport. And and I think he's an incredible person, incredible driver. Like I, I really am a fan of his, but then you just feel like you're everyone else on that team is outcasted. And to go against that as, as Carlos signs and, you know, basically what finish fourth in the, in the driver's chair, I think he took P5 in the champ- driver's yeah, championship. Yeah, P5. Carlos Sainz, I've got the driver table up right now. Carlos Sainz had fifth position and he had 164 points, and he his teammate was the closest to him in a sense because Leclerc was 159. So there was literally about five points separating them. Yeah, and and I think I think the same could be actually said about Checo. Like you know, Sergio Perez. Look, he he's literally taken one for the team. It, Max doesn't win without him. Like Max does literally not win the championship without him as his, his defense, teammate. especially in that last race, like the two best defensive driving things. And it's funny you mentioned this Todd as well. And Nick, I'll let you get back to it, but I'm always kind of configured when I come to a new sport in the video game sense of like, give me the characteristics of each team. So that way I know what to look for. And it's been hard for me to kind of get into formula one that way, because ultimately there's no, nothing simple that says, Max, 10 out of 10 aggression, cornering 7 out of 10. It, it's going to take me years to get that. But the defensive display that Alonso and, more importantly, Perez put in that last race are ultimately what kept Lewis from winning this title. Yeah, I mean, and, and you kind of already have an example of how this will play out, right? Botas running with, with Lewis the last seven years always being the second man on the team, you know, had plenty of podiums, plenty of, of wins even. But at the end of that run, he's going to go race for a team that, you know, is not going to be, well, with, with the exception of all these rule changes, right? Rule changes throw enough of a wrench in for everyone that anybody has the potential to be competitive. Not like a Mercedes or a Red Bull, but like any team could become a much better team next season. But, you know, you, you spend seven years as the, as the backup, as, as the, you know, take one for the team player, you know, I hope that, that Sergio Perez, you know, I hope that works out for him. You know, I I don't know how else to say it. It sounds like I'm trying to be demeaning or something, but you know, it's just really tough to run as like the number two when clearly you're an incredible driver. You know, so I think there's I think there's, you know, all that long winded to say that he deserves, you know, at least a few votes in that driver of the year conversation. No, I'm frustrated in a sense because you guys took both of my answers. So I'll just throw a couple more drivers and I'll just get 
impressions from the both of you. For me, this is the second year in a row that this particular driver that I'm about to mention has killed it, despite being in what I consider now to be almost a lower midfield team, and that's one Pierre Gasly from AlphaTauri. I mean, we know, especially if you're a Drive to Survive fan, you literally watch this man's heartbreak on air, on camera, when he got demoted from Red Bull, because to your point, Nick, he just wasn't what that number two position needed to be. And so they send him back down to the minors. And my goodness, the way that this man gets results out of what is clearly an inferior car, yet he pushes these guys and he had a podium last year. No, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, gentlemen. He won a race last year. He had a couple of podiums. He has one podium this year. And with the exception of two races, and th- uh, he was constantly active and he only did not score points in four races on top of that. So he's fantastic. And the other one who... I'm going to give him this award premeditatively in a sense, but George Russell getting some of the results that he did in that car. And that is one of the things that I'm going to be looking very interested in in the next coming years. What does Russell do? Because my goodness, if there is ever a person that seems almost overqualified to be a second banana, it might be George Russell, despite the fact that he is probably in that same age range as Max and Charles Leclerc and Pierre Gasly. So it is a good time because I think we are seeing in real time this changing the guard. And my goodness, it is a young league right now. Yeah. the uh, So I'm so glad you brought up <clears throat> Pierre Gasly because uh, he was like a 1A, 1B to the Carlos Sainz or me giving Carlos Sainz the driver of the year. Um, I think he qualified sixth in like – at like seven races in a row in what, what you would say is like an inferior car. I think it was like a, a pretty quick car for like the, the, you know, the midfield, which is such a, such a tight battle. Um, but I think that they just didn't have the, you know, luck wasn't necessarily on their side. And then, and, and you, you kind of have to have your, your teammate also in the battle. And we know the sad story of Yuki this year. And I just, I love Yuki so much. I want him to be better. And he really started to come around at the end of the season. But yeah, Gasly, I think is if if it wouldn't have been science, I would have said Gasly. He just was absolutely epic in, in what he's doing. And I guess the reason I wouldn't give it to him or I gave it to science over him is because he was already an established driver in the Alpha Tower team. And the uh and and science was coming into Ferrari. Fair. Yeah. I think I think you know Yuki's last what five races or something like that were just like amazing. It was so cool to see him kind of I you know I don't want to get too much into the personalities of these guys, but like I got so frustrated when Max was like trash talking Yuki for trying to get out of the way on their hot laps, whatever. I can't remember what that was. Two or three races back, right? And like that's also like one of the things that like. I just, I just can't, I need you to be a decent person, you know, like, don't get me wrong. Like I love the competitiveness, but Yuki is like this, especially him and, and Gasly, like the way that they vibe together and we'll get into this, but like, you know, I like, I like seeing the camaraderie from the team. You know, I, I like seeing the respect amongst the teams and amongst the drivers themselves. And I think that's, that's really kind of a, t- a like a talking point for maybe an- another episode is like how these guys kind of look at their, at their teammates and, and their peers is, is really an interesting thing because it seems like to your point about the changing the guard, it seems like the young generation for the most part, at least is very much like friendly you know, hangs out together on weekends on, you know, non-race weekends. And it seems like, Hey, these guys are just having fun living their dreams. And I, I love that about this, like, uh, you know, upcoming generation. I just think like, yeah, this is like, you know, this is what it's all about. I'm going to say like, they they like their e-carts. They like staying indoors. And (laughs) there's this narrative around race car drivers being these James Bond types in a sense, they're playboys, they're affable, hell, they're arrogant. They think they're God's gift to everything that they do, and they have to be in a sense because that's the type of mental fortitude that's needed with that vocation. Yep. 
Yuki is America and, dare I say, the Globe's sweetheart. Like, we are all ride-or-die Yuki Sonoda fans. It's just how quickly do we come to that realization, whether it's the rampant cursing on air, whether it's just the self-frustration. Like, the best way I can describe it is you are literally watching somebody grow up in front of our eyes where he knows he has to do better. He gets frustrated. But then there are other times where my man doesn't care that he's the youngest dude on the track. He doesn't care that he has the most – or rather the least amount of experience, he's going to go balls to the wall. And that's what's unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you want to look at it. And I think we're all anti-Max yet again in this sentiment. That's what endears us to him. So I'm for it. And it was funny because I know how much it pains you to kind of say that, Todd, because I know you're ride or die Danny Rick guy. But to me, and granted, I've only seen this because my exposure to this, and I hate to sound like a broken record, has been Drive to Survive. But I thought it was really interesting the first season how – it was more Danny Rick centric. And then probably one of the best episodes in season two was Carlos Sainz going into McLaren and just kind of dedicating himself to that. And the American comparison I could think of was I get a Danny Rick is more of a Kevin Garnett where Carlos Sainz is more of a Tim Duncan in the sense that they're both fantastic drivers. One has charisma oozing out of his pores and the other one is just kind of bland in a sense, but he just goes about his day. And I will go for Danny Rick because he makes me laugh. And unfortunately, my wife has a huge crust on Carlos Sainz, and we're not trying to hear that on this podcast. So. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But I will use this favorite moment in a sense to talk about some other favorite moments you guys had seen during the year that you wanted to kind of shine a light on. Nick, you go. Uh, I mean, I think if I were to pick an uh, just, you know, I think there's two favorite moments I have. The 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 racing favorite moment is really Espan Ocon winning in like the shit show of all shit show races, you know. Stole my answer. Good answer. Because anytime that these races are just like, you know, till the wheels fall off, who's going to make it to, you know. I just, you know, I I I I'd rather see racing than crashes, but when all of that stuff starts to happen and you're just like, let's just hope that they all survive. And then you see someone who has never won actually come out on top. It's just like a beautiful thing. So that was definitely my favorite, you know, kind of, kind of like heartfelt moment, I guess. Um, Outside of actually racing. I mean, this podcast will probably end up being a lot of uh, Dan and Ricardo fanboying, but his whole everything about Austin was <laughs> absolutely incredible. Like he's everything that you want in an entertainer and he's an incredible driver. And that was just like that weekend was just, yeah, I wish I was there. I will now defer to senior Daniel and Ricardo correspondent Todd Yates for a follow up on that. Okay. So, Obviously, favorite moment of the year was Monza, the McLaren one too, a bit fortuitous. Um, but it was, it's been a god, I think it was 2012 was their last win, so that was good. And then to get a one two on top of that was a bit nervous. I don't know, maybe 10 or so laps in when Lando was asking about the pace and saying like he needs to pick up the pace because I'm, you know, they're starting to creep up on me. And I was like, oh gosh. Um, but that was, that was an easy number one. And then, uh, it's, uh, well, no, I'll save that for saddest moment. Cause it was like, a, it was like a bittersweet, but we'll talk about that in a second. Hey, he is ever showman. I will say, I agree with the Ocon thing, but just in case I knew one of you might take that answer, I'll say a favorite moment for me and granted a this may be a bit hearsay to some of the people listening. I like the emergence of Ferrari again because there is this popular narrative in America, especially where there are certain teams that make your sport more enjoyable. So there's always a train of thought that, oh, if the Knicks are good, NBA is better. If Miami Hurricanes are good, college football is better, or USC. So whatever sport you have, baseball, I've got two baseball guys here with me. I guess in a sense, if the Yankees are good, there is a evil empire aspect that you love to hate. In this case, I think Ferrari – has nailed it. And it's interesting given their history where they do tend to favor one driver over the other. But I would say this, they are probably as complete of a team as you can have if your name is not Mercedes or Red Bull. And the most important thing to me is 
for all of the hype that Charles Leclerc gets, he still seems to be very approachable because I think we are going to be talking about him in the same hush tones that we would if there was no Max Verstappen in terms of the next crown prince because he has that pedigree. I believe his godfather was driving for Ferrari and then he passed away and that's kind of been the culmination of a lifelong journey that he got to join them. And he has this moments where in spite of the chaos and instability at Ferrari, which always seems to be a focal point of every one of their eras, they did really well. And Carlos Sainz is probably the most decorated, most professional driver in terms of just putting his head down and working because the last, the next time you hear any sort of Carlos Sainz outburst will probably be the first time. And you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. So I just think Ferrari kind of getting to where they need to be was interesting to me because I do think it's nice. And there is something about that red that when it goes through the finish line, like you're like, this is a proper organization. As long as it's the right shade of red, because that car this right. year was god awful. <laughs> yeah, that, that may be one of my biggest disappointments as well. And I think we'll use this opportunity, uh, opportunity, wow, opportunity to go to the next topic, which is around biggest disappointments. I'll start us off at this one, and maybe I overrated this, but Aston Martin should have been a lot better considering what they had coming off of last year. And the driver. Now, granted, this is team nepotism in a sense, because if we're unaware, the father of one of the drivers is the owner, and maybe that's the reason why Lance Stroll continues to get an extended look in Formula 1. I do think there are flashes there where he proves to be a competent driver, but I don't know if he's at the same level of some of his other peers. But ultimately, it also helps that he has Nikita Mazepin to deflect all that attention to, (laughs) as... Todd Yates will proudly tell you because I think as much as he loves Danny Rick, he also loves to twist that knife into the Mazapan family back. But Nick, how about you? What was your biggest disappointment for the year? I mean, I, this might be stealing Todd's, but Lando in Russia, you know, the, the, just the miscalculation on the tires. I really thought he was going to win because he was, you know, this is the race. I think this is the race directly after the one, two finish, right? Russia was the next, the next race. Was it? I'm pretty I'm sure at it, right it now. was. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, like, was. I, I honestly thought like, this is it. Lando's going to get it. Cause you know, I, I wanted, I, I, I want to see McLaren win, but I also want to see Lando win. Like, I feel like, you know, he, he just, he was so close and he was getting there and he was on that hot streak almost. And I think that was kind of the fall off point for him in the season. You know, he still was very competitive throughout the end of the year, but once that whole slip up happened and they, I can't remember, you know, he just, he didn't go in and change tires. Everyone else changed tires, thought he could make it and ends up, you know, going off the rain starts coming down harder. And, you know, that's a tough lesson to learn, but, I, you know, I just really wanted to see him win. I think like the, uh, the, you know, the one a to my most disappointing or, or saddest moment of the year is Kimi Raikkonen retiring, you know, watching him for what seems like my entire life at this point. And, you know, remembering him literally walking straight onto the yacht and drinking after, you know, crashing out and seeing him fall you know, just his entire persona that is, you know, it's basically like if you had the ultimate party animal, but the person was always on mute and they just never spoke because he just doesn't have anything to say to anyone, but he's going to go have a good time. You know, just being, seeing him, you know, knowing that we might actually never hear him speak again is a little, is a little sad. (laughs) So yeah, you, you kind of, Lump those two together. I like that. So biggest disappointment, and I'll start there. Um, It's just got to be, and this is, I can't believe I'm about to say this, but it's Daniel Ricciardo. Like, to be such a highly rated driver, and he is, he's he is one of the top talents, I still think. But to not be able to get his head around the McLaren through basically the whole season, we thought, you know, the, the win at Monzo, that was what right before the summer break, I think, right? That they went on summer break after that, and then they came back to Russia. Yes. Uh, it was like, oh, my God, he's finally got it. Okay, second half of the season. And then uh, he just continued to be three, four, five tenths off of Lando in qualifying. And 
I know he had some bad luck. He had some retirements, things like that. But I, I, I'm hoping, I'm praying, obviously, to for that he takes the time off, comes back next season, new car, new feel, new rules. Maybe they'll be able to develop around him a little bit more because I feel like they really do want, instead of a 1-2, they want a 1A, 1B situation in, in McLaren. Um, and, you know, Ricardo will sell still t-shirts till till the end of time but uh yeah that's he's just got to be the biggest disappointment for the season because i i everyone thought he was gonna come in with his experience and just even though it's as talented as lando is just wipe the floor with with lando and then saddest moment is yeah kimmy retiring from his last race uh, you know, you want him to go out on top. And it was, like I mentioned earlier, it was kind of a bittersweet moment. They, I saw on the F1 YouTube that they have drivers write per, three predictions down at the beginning of the season, and they put it in a sealed envelope, and then they save them the entire year. And Kimmy, before he had announced his retirement, before people knew, wrote down, most surprising thing of the season, nothing. Um, uh so, uh, I can't remember what the second question was, but his answer was, I'll be, or no, what, what's your feeling going to be at the end of the season is uh, uh, excitement because this will be my last F1 race. And his third thought was just goodbye. And that's just classic Kimmy. And like, literally he like read it and just walked off camera and, and just continued being Kim, Kimmy to the very last <laughs> second. So saddest but also bittersweet because we got to enjoy kimmy for the last 20 years but yeah, yeah those are mine no we I, were chatting about this before the lights went out so to speak on this podcast and there was a talk about entering athlete press conference mode kimmy raikkonen is rasheed wallace he's marshall Lentz. he's just here not to get fined and the funniest thing to me about kimmy raikkonen is this year we saw the we races one psa before every race and if you watch that psa Every other driver will say at least one word. And when it comes to Mr. Raikkonen, all you see from Kimi is just this. And then they cut to somebody else. And I think they gave Pierre Gasly two words because Raikkonen didn't even have time to say the one word. So yeah. thank you, Kimi, for all that you do. And I will say this to just add a somewhat uplifting note about Danny Rick. I think one of my favorite moments of the year that I forgot about was because he won the race at Monza, he got to drive, I believe, the Dale Earnhardt car. So talk to me about the significance of that, Todd, because I think he's a big Dale Earnhardt uh, fan. And my hope for Danny Rick is similar to what we see with European soccer players that occasionally come over to the MLS when their career is done, but they still want to get that one last paycheck. If there isn't a driver that's made for NASCAR in the non-American sense, it has to be Danny Rick, no? Oh, yeah. Like, he's he was uh, a, a big uh, Dale Earnhardt fan. Um, he liked, I think mostly because of his nickname, the intimidator. Um, but yeah, so Zach Brown, the CEO of, uh, McLaren owns the 84 Earnhardt car. And he said, if he gets, I think the bet was just, if he gets a podium, uh, just like they yeah, had that. I thought it was the first. No, I think it was just a podium because they okay. had the same bet. So Danny Rick had that bet with Cyril, uh, yes. Cyril at um, Renault, Renault Alp Alpine, um, but he just said, "But yeah, you get a podium, your first podium, you'll get to drive this car." And he gave him a diecast model of it, and they showed that uh, last year, and that was that was really cool. So, you know, him getting to kick the tires and light the fires, as they say, uh, at, at at Austin this year was just great. And like the photos that came out of that, he's going around a turn. And it's, you know, it's not set up for that. And it's from 40 years ago, but him going around a, a, a turn at like 80 and his just got the biggest grin that you can see because they made him wear an open face helmet and everything. It was just, it was great. Yeah. I, 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 I got to rewind a little bit and just say, I think the actual most disappointing thing about this season was just the stewards. Like, I just thought it was wildly inconsistent. And, uh, you know, it's really tough because, you know, even as diehard fans, we can't possibly understand the regulations to the level that, you know, the teams, the engineers, the, the stewards, know, it just the stewards. Yeah. And, 
And I also would never want to be in a position where I have to interpret those rules when, you know, the championship is on the line, but they were consistent, consistently pretty terrible this year in a way that like made it, it made it apparent that the stewards were always going to be a part of the, the conversation, which is to me as it was probably the most frustrating part of the, the season. Uh, in a sense, referees should be like children. They should be seen but not heard. But the fact that they imposed themselves as much as they did was a bit jarring. And I know as much as I got frustrated with the results of that last race and being a stickler for the rules in the sense, and the argument I always heard back is, well, you don't want to get bogged, uh, bogged down in the rules because uh, at the end of the day, it's just a race. Yes, but there is a sense of decorum that has to be met. But it's one of those things of... How far can you go? So ultimately, less stewards next year would be a hopeful prediction for us. And I'll use that now to ask you both, give me, because we've got a little bit of time, give me three predictions for next year. And if not, I, I've got one off the top of my head. I'll start. I will say this. My first bold prediction for 2022 will be Lewis Hamilton will win his title back, but... Red Bull will win the constructors title this year. Wow. There's a shot. That's you should go put money on that because that's the chances of that happening are no, no, and it's one of those things where the only reason why I feel that, because I think Lewis is gonna go full John Wick, he's gonna go full scorched earth. He is going to go after everybody. I I'm assuming if he stays to race, this will be as motivated as we've seen somebody because I don't want to use this example because it's not as serious as what Jesse Owens did in the Olympics, where he literally told the Nazis, hold my medal. I'm going to take a step back and jump even further back. So you're not going to disqualify me on this. I just see, I just think we see a very focused, very determined Lewis to say there is no closeness between Max and I as a racer. So I see motivated Lewis. It's just a question of does Russell know how to play that part? And I think he is a great driver, but is he a great teammate? And to your point as well, what we've kind of said, Checo knows how to be a number two now, and it's max team. There's no issue with that. If he gets a first place or a couple podiums, that goes to the plan. But I just don't see Lewis and George meshing as well. I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, stepping back and looking at Lewis's career, right? He is the most competitive person on the planet, in my opinion. But he's also, he also doesn't, at this point in his career, he's not viewed as that because of all of the things he does off of, the, you know, racetrack, all of the things he's involved in, all the things he's just passionate about. You know, the, the, I think the, you know, the little bit of buzz around, you know, does he even want to race again is kind of just, mute point at this, you know, moment, because look, you're tied with Schumacher, you know, you need one more championship to be the best to like, to officially have the stamp of the best ever. I just don't see him not coming back. And to your point, Roy, I don't see him not coming back and being absolutely dominant. Like, I think that, I think that Lewis will win, you know, I, I say this because I think that Mercedes does better with new cars always, right? They have more resources than most of the teams, no matter no matter how you slice up that money and how many limits are put into place on spending. They just they've been doing this a really long time and they know how to make it happen. And I think that if if there's anything that you could kind of look at to see that George might already know his place in that team you know, he came out right away and, and was like questioning the results. And it's almost like, All yeah, caps. yeah. He just, if everyone was being like hundred percent honest with themselves, whether you're a Verstappen fan or a Lewis fan, the end of that race was kind of like, what, you know, like we all just walked away from it thinking like, well, I, what did we just watch? Like, it was like, okay, cool. We decided halfway through the, you know, third to last lap, we decided that we were just going to do a sprint for the last last lap. And that was going to be the deciding factor of the season. You know, 
even even I mean Lando came, after the race came on and was like I don't want to I don't want to make a comment you know everybody kind of was dismissive of it but I think next year you're going to see Lewis come back and just like solidify his place I don't think that Max is going to be you know pushed aside very easily but I think that Mercedes is going to be really strong regardless of the changes the rules um I think the rest of the racing is going to be probably the best we've ever seen. You're going to have more fans. You're going to have more, you know, more races and arguably more competitive cars than, than this season. Right. You know, there's no question, you know, from anybody that's been a fan, like Red Bull and Mercedes were so far beyond the rest of the teams, you know, with, with a few exceptions, right? Like obviously you'll have, you'll have moments, but, you know, those cars were just so dominant. I mean, what, you know, they won all, like, those are all the, all the wins other than Ocon and Ricardo, yeah, right? right? And, uh, yeah, I'm trying to see that right now. I think there's like two, two wins that weren't a Red Bull or Mercedes, something like that. But in a way, is that the highest we've seen when it comes to non big two, uh, first place finishes? I mean, I don't know that that's the highest we've seen. Cause you know, to Todd's point earlier, the Schumacher years with Ferrari were like, you know, I mean, I was, I was, you know, watching to see who was coming in fourth and fifth. You just knew that Michael was going to win. Like there were, there were times, but also Lewis was that two, three years ago at times. You just were like, do we even need to watch this? You know, if we know the result already, um, but that that's just, it all just, just speaks to, to his consistency. You know, like, I think that's the, I think, I think if there's a takeaway for Lewis, he's going to look at this season and say, I'm not going to be in that position where I have to be the one that plays it safe going into the last three, four races of the year. And, you know, he's capable of winning probably in most of the cars that are out there. Max is capable of winning in most of the cars that are out there. The rest of the drivers, I'd say, you know, maybe Danny Rick is, is close there, but I think everybody else kind of falls into that, that like middle of the pack group where now you've got everybody resetting the rules and everybody starting with the new car, how fast and how far along have you come in developing that to really, you know, you know, get out of the gates quickly, I guess on the next season, but I don't know. What do you think, Todd? Uh, yeah. So to start, I'll say, I absolutely agree with both of you. There's no chance in hell that Lewis retires this year. He wants, he's, he's, as you said, John work, John Wick scorched earth. He's going to come back probably better and, and more determined and probably more aggressive than we've seen him before. We saw several times this year that, that he knew Max was going to go for the dive bomb and kind of backed out of it, went wide, whatever. Um, I feel like Silverstone this year is the one time he, kind of said, no, you're not going to back me down anymore. And then we saw what happened. That The first part of that lap was the best racing wheel-to-wheel -wheel that we saw all year. It was just the first like five or six yeah. corners were just mind-blowing how they can be literally millimeters apart at 160 miles an hour with basically total precision. Um, but I, I absolutely agree with both of you. No way in hell that Lewis retires. But I think my prediction, first prediction for for this year is that these cars next year are supposed to promise us closer racing, more competitive racing, um, you know, closer following, you know, without burning the tires up too much. I think that engineers at the, the, at the end of the day are engineers and we're going to see the same pecking order for the most part that we see now, that this season we saw. We, we if you... I know, Rohit, you weren't watching back then, and, and Nick, you were. Uh, when we saw the turbo hybrid era start in, in 2014, basically after that four years of Red Bull dominance, it it was just kind of a changing of the guard then. But for the most part, everybody stayed kind of, yeah. you know, everyone had their trajectories, but everyone was kind of, the changeover was like, okay, we know where we are. Um, I, I don't think that we're going to see, you know, a half a second between P1 and P20, you know, like we're, we're going to see Red Bull and Mercedes at the top. We're going to see 
probably Ferrari, McLaren, maybe Alpine with it. They're, they're showing at the last half of the season in that battle. And then we'll see the rest, you know, the midfield and then the back end with, with Haas. Mm-hmm. No, I like that because that's kind of the direction I wanted to head in. And I think we'll just combine predictions in a sense. I think we will see three first place finishes that are non Mercedes and non Red Bull next year. Now, don't ask me who those three are. I think McLaren will take at least one. I'm expecting Ferrari. And then it'll be a dogfight, I think, between Pierre Gasly, somebody from Alpine, and somebody from Aston Martin, because I do think they will be much improved. And I think, I guess this will be my other bold prediction. I think they will finish in that four or five spot in terms of best of the rest that aren't Mercedes and Red Bull and Ferrari's kind of its own lane still now that they've kind of come back as number three. And I don't know. I just think from a talent perspective, maybe I'm overrating that all a little. I just think similar to what we were saying about Lewis, I don't see Seb going out on his shield the way that he kind of did this year. But now as I'm kind of talking this out, it's a pretty bold take and I'm not that bold. So I will walk that back quietly while I wait for Nick to give me his next prediction. Nick, what's your next prediction? I mean, I think the one thing that's really interesting about the variables for next year, you know, to Todd's point about the turbo hybrid era, things didn't change that much. But this year, I think that the teams are way more competitive in the midfield than back then. And I I don't remember specifics, but I also think that it's interesting that there's not a lot of changes in these teams going to happen, right? Personnel wise, driver wise. There's a ton actually. This year. Yeah. There's a lot of big changes, a lot of Red Bull with their powertrains department. Well, that, so that part aside, no driver changes, oh. right? With like, let's say Mercedes, Ferrari, etc. Yeah, yeah, so that was going to be my other point. The tasks. other variable that we cannot overlook is that Red Bull has to make their own engines next year. I know they're going to have all the Honda engineers, but Honda also has been doing that for 70, 80 years, whatever it's been, you know, like, you know, you know, that other side hustle that they have making cars for the rest of the world. Red Bull, you know, they pay people, pay people to jump off of freaking, you know, Flugtag and whatever it is and, you know, snowboard. And don't get me wrong. I love all that stuff. And I love the idea of a non-automotive manufacturer becoming a manufacturer in Formula One. It's mind-blowingly awesome to me. But it is like, no matter how good they are, that is like the most pressure you could ever put on a team, in my opinion. That is, you know, a team of engineers, right? Obviously drivers and, you know, uh, you know, CEOs and team principals and all that have tons of pressures. But the idea that like you don't have, you know, and I know they'll have backing and they'll have access to a lot of Honda people for a long time to come. But it's a big it's a big deal. And I think it's I think it's under I don't think it can be understated. I think that's a that's a huge like there is like maybe a a 5% or less chance that Red Bull just absolutely shits the bed when it comes to, 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 you know, becoming the manufacturer and you know, that, that, that could throw everything for a loop for years to come. If, if it happens, I don't think it's likely, but I'm, I do think it is possible. I think that's very fair. Todd, any last uh, crazy prediction before I think we end for the night? Because we are approaching that magical hour where I've got to go to bed. And I think so to both of you. Um, Yeah, uh, I think we have even more drivers win a race than we had this year. So we had six different drivers, I think, win a race. Uh, I think we have even more next year due to the variables of the cars that Nick just mentioned. Um, And then a third crazy one is I think Mazepin, no matter what, doesn't win a race. He's going to end up in P20 again in the championship. And I'll be happy as hell to see that. You know, it's funny. I actually, he classified as P21 in the championship uh, because Robert Kubica had to sub in for a race and finish that race. 
And because they both had zero points, and I think Robert Kubitz has late race longer, he actually got P20, and Mazepin got P21. So, Do you think Mick Schumacher will score any points next year? It's Like, will Haas score so points? So that's a really interesting question, and I don't want to go over the hour, but... Uh, no, we're, we're giving you the permission, because I was flirting with this as well as one of my crazy predictions, is <laughs> Haas will get one point next year. See, I think they could do. I mean, I hope they're, they're the only American American team, quote unquote, that they uh, are are on the grid, and they took an entire year off of development for the current car to build this next gen car. And if they don't thrust themselves violently into the midfield pack, then just just sell the team, Gene Haas, make it the Russian team it already yep. is, your alkali, whatever the hell. Um, just, just, just let go because if you can't, and I love Gunter, but just. Now, I mean, I put it this way, Apollo Creed is rolling in his grave the way we've seen an American bow down to a Russian like this. And it's absurd. And I agree with you. Like, I think Gunter Schne uh, Steiner, team principal for Haas is probably built to be that next analyst, the third man in the booth, so to speak, because he is charismatic in his own weird French German way. But yeah, I think this has been as frustrating of an experience as something that is as loosely affiliated to America as I've seen in Formula One, and I don't like it. And I definitely hope that, and this is me being a patriot in a sense, like I hope we retain its American roots, and I hope we don't necessarily bow down to Russia as much as we did, because this team is literally a completely different team than the Haas that we've known, because they've changed their livery up in such a way that my goodness, it's – I almost think that's part of the reason why. The karmic implications of completely changing your identity, and I get it. People need to secure the bag to continue racing, but this was just disgusting. And sorry to get all Joe Buck on you. <laughs> I mean, I, th I think that's an interesting point though, right? Like they took that year off. Obviously, they had no intention of really competing, but they didn't want to back out completely. And I think that there's definitely a, a – a lot of potential for the Haas team. They they made strides prior to this season that were impressive, right? I'm not saying that they're, you know, going to be competing for a title or, you know, anywhere up at the top of the field, but like they did, you know, they they did pretty well for for a young team for that first what, 3 years. 2017 they years. got P4 in the yeah, constructors. Yeah, mm -hmm. like that's crazy, right? So I think that's an interesting kind of uh, it'll be like a, a, a another storyline for the for the Netflix, you know. But what I actually am most excited about this, I don't know if it'll happen this upcoming season or the following season. This growth in American fans, you know, to your point about like you know, Mazepin shouldn't be driving, right? Like he, you know, he's just not. He's driving because he's connected to whoever's investing in the team. If if Haas moves, let's say, into like a fifth or sixth, fourth, fifth or sixth, let's just give them a huge benefit of the doubt, then there's no reason that we shouldn't have massive American companies plastering their names on those cars because there are plenty of people in America watching Formula One this year. Texas, you know, 130,000 people or whatever that showed up for the Texas race. Like, that's the thing that I'm looking forward to, like. American sponsors will bring American fans in ways that we just can't really fathom. Right. I mean, I don't know how, how or who it will be, but you know, just, you know, imagine Nike throwing their name into the mix with a team. Haas is the best choice, right? Like, you know, it, you know, in, in that grander scheme of like good old American, whatever, it's like, it's gotta happen. Somebody's going to do it. So I hope it happens next season and I hope there's like just like excitement. I don't even really care what brand it is. I just hope that there's a, a big American sponsor that comes in and says, cool, we want to be a part of this. It's, it's too cool to not be a part of it. And that big American sponsor will be the Secret History Podcasting Network. And we'll use this as an out. So thank you guys so much for staying with us here on Exhaust Notes. My lovely panel today. Fellas, where can they find you on the social media? Uh, you can find me most importantly in the Sneaker History Discord and automotive um 
Uh, and all my socials are at T Yeezy. Uh, you can find me at Nick Ingvall on all the platforms. But yeah, as Todd said, Sneaker History Discord, Artemotive Discord, and on these podcasts with you guys. Yep. At Rohizi on Twitter, at RoadM13 on Instagram, and just wandering the streets of Portland for a couple more days. Anyway, we wanted to make sure we thank you guys for your continual support, and thank you, everyone. Peace.